hope everybody gonna have a good time tonight, huh? Woo you ready to do a little bit of celebrating, huh? We ready to get down? You ready to get down? It's a celebration. Celebrate good times. Come on. Let's celebrate. Celebrate good times. Come on. Let's celebrate. The music scene in Des Moines is alive and well. You can find rock, blues, jazz, country, and Latin music in places all over town. But there isn't the buzz of the nightclub scene that was so hot in the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s before the disco wave happened. But you had to be of the caliber of Joe Hernandez and the Cavaliers to land a gig like that. He was one of the last musicians and entertainers that pulled a loyal following night after night. Start spreading the news I'm leaving today I want to be a part of it New York, New York These vagabond shoes Are longing to stray And step around the heart of it New York, New York Joe was born on April 5th, 1949 in Fort Madison, Iowa to Raul and Josephine Hernandez. He was the oldest of five kids. He grew up in a small house with his sisters and brother Ralph, also known as R.J. Brother Joe and I grew up together in the same bedroom from 1958, I think it was when I finally started rooming with him, till I think when he got married the first time in 67. And what I remember mostly was a guy that uh, took care of his little brother. He lived in a rough neighborhood. And then I remember this kid pounding the piano constantly, be it rehearsal or, or just belting out a song. And then all of a sudden, the Be Beatle invasion back in 64. And then I remember him playing the bass. So if Joe wasn't playing his bass or singing, we had a little downstairs part that was all Joe's, his little room, because he was going to be a DJ. Welcome to KGDWI. That was Joe. I remember the initial audition. That was the Monarchs, Luke Cattarucci. My father and Raul, which was Joe's dad, were good friends. And Raul gave my dad a call and said, it's time uh, that my son enter into the music business. So uh, we get there, Joe, uh, Joe's sitting out on the front porch, and uh, he's got his little microphone there, and he's got his uh, Sears silver tone bass amp with his uh, bass guitar. Uh, it was so beautiful because uh, he was so young and naive, and we all were, really. And uh, Big, uh, big Raul comes out of the house and shook our hands and introduced everybody and uh, said, uh, Joe, sing us a song. So Joe has played his little bass line and he came out with a beautiful rendition of Blue Moon. And uh, the song has stuck with me my whole life. Such, such a beautiful opportunity to hear, that, uh, hear, the, hear those chops. And I knew immediately uh, that uh, he, he was ready. So I was already working with a, a playing band. I mean, we were gigging all over the state of Iowa. Uh, my mom used to uh, pull a trailer behind her Thunderbird, you know, get us from job to job, because there was only a couple of us in the band that was old enough to drive, but really too young to be out on our own. So I think it was up to Carroll, Iowa, played the uh, ballroom up there. 
uh, at, uh, at the time we're supposed to start, there's got to be like 300 people sitting out there waiting for the band to start. And uh, we took the stage and we strike our first tune. Papa's got a brand new bag. Joe's got the lead. All of a sudden, 150 women all jumped up and rushed to the stage and left 150 guys sitting in their chair. It was like a concert. It wasn't a dance, man. It was a concert. And yeah, I mean, they were just, they were just drooling over Joe. It was, it was such a gas. Not too bad, I get a call out of the blue one day from uh, Steve Gleason, the leader of the Cavaliers at the time. And uh, he says, look, we're going to be doing some big, big showrooms, some big ballrooms and this and that. I want you to play our opening set that we'll come on, uh, do a couple of shows, and then I want you to play the closing dance set. I could see uh, when the Cavaliers took the stage, Joe was entranced. It made me nervous. I, I, I knew something was, was, was going on in his head. Uh, we were in the need of a bass player. We'd already had two, and uh, one was leaving, and we needed a bass player. And they said, there was this kid that's really good. You ought to go hear him. He's playing at the Riviera Ballroom. And um, this kid, and it was Joe, sang just like an angel. Unbelievable voice. 15 years old, couldn't believe it. So I called his house, and typical Joe, he's real cool. Say hello. So yeah, this is Gary Grimes you know, with the Cavaliers. I want to know if you'd like to play with us. He says, well, I'm, I'd have to talk it over with my dad just a minute. And in the background, I heard him screaming, Dad, Dad, the Cavaliers are calling. The Cavaliers are calling. They want me to play with them. So pretty soon he comes back to the phone. He goes, yeah, I'll play with you. So it was, you know, that's the way he always was. He was real quiet and aloof, and, uh, but inside there was a lot of excitement. And uh, Joe comes to me, and he says, Louie, he says, the Cavaliers got an opening for me, and I'd like, I'd like to take the gig. I couldn't believe it. I was, it was devastating. And I said, okay, man, you know, at least you, had, you, you, got, you got some, you know, strength to meet me face to face and, and tell me what you want. And I wish you all the luck in the world and much success. The thing I remember about the original Cavaliers, there was uh, five of them. Remember the Italian, Judah Chessie. Right. Um, then there was Marvin right. Spencer, tall black man, right. could sing. Oh, then there was the drummer in the back, studying to be a doctor. Right. Even in high school, right out of high school, he could be a doctor and he could always, always talk his body into not getting tired and keeping the rhythm, oh, keep the backbone, right. Joe used to say. Then, of course, my brother Joe, the Mexican, so they kind of had a United Nations of the group. And that was the original Cavaliers. Oh, it's all right. It's all right to have a good time. It's all right. Oh, it's all right. Joe made it a point to surround himself with the best singers and musicians. There were more than 50 musicians who worked with Joe between the 60s and the 90s. I know how to get it before you have to call me. I'll be there. 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 The Cavaliers were replacing their drummer. And I went up on a break and talked to Joe, and he pretty much dismissed me very quickly. Gary Grimes and Dominic Judicesi, who were still in the band at the time, both said, oh, I'll give the, give the kid a try. Two days later, I'm their drummer full time. The other gentleman decided to go his way. I first met Joe Hernandez probably when my dad and his dad would get together to rehearse. They played in a band way back when we were kids, so I would imagine we were probably five, 
six years old. Joe's probably a couple years older than me, so he was probably eight by that time. I, I just know that we were together at that time, no real recollection of what we did. We played, I suppose, like kids would. Joe was, would get his way, of course, and uh, I would follow. Back in the early 70s, not quite sure just exactly when, Janie Hooper was in a band that I had and uh, we would play some of the clubs around the Des Moines area, one of them being the Butterfly. And that was down in, on Old Court Avenue before Court Avenue really took off. Some members of the Cavaliers were in and uh, checking out the band. And of course, they heard Janie Hooper. And well, it wasn't long before Janie was not in my band anymore. Um, Joe snagged her and offered her a job where she could be working pretty much five nights a week. That's how bands were playing back then. I mean, the club scene was hot and heavy, and you could survive. But then I got a call from Janie Hooper that the Cavaliers were looking for a guitar player and would I like to try out. So um, I went to see, to the audition and try it out. Got to meet Joe again. And uh, anyway, I got the gig. So I started playing with the Cavaliers and uh, played with them through uh, a lot of that 70s era into, um, into the 80s. Five minutes, we're gonna feature Valdez on this one. If you got a request you'd like to hear, just kind of send it up. We got our quarter fill for this set. About it. When I was so low, you were there to lift me up. Well, there's one thing that I know for sure, babe. You're going to win life's love and cup. Just starting out in the music business, a young musician. Um, I was playing with Tony Valdez, a band called Children, starting to take piano lessons from Sam Salomon, and, and um, found out that Cavaliers were looking for a keyboard player to go on the road. It was a great experience. I learned a whole lot in short, very short amount of time. Rehearsing with the Cavaliers was um, very enlightening as far as what goes on to put together a group with this magnitude with three and four part harmony, horn parts, violin lines. It took a lot of practice to get to the point where the finished product was polished and Joe definitely made sure the product was polished and that's what made the Cavaliers sound. It was a lot of work. It wasn't all fun and games and partying or any of that sort of stuff. Yes. I mean, you, you say, well, we're going to learn such, such song, and he, he already knew it. Knew the harmony parts, knew it. I mean, he just, everything was just like that with him. James Brown was his deal, though. That's, that's Man, he'd do this James Brown, and we'd do a James Brown show. We'd do a bunch of James Brown, and we'd do Please, Please, and he'd do the whole thing, the dancing, and down on his knees, and we'd put, uh, Marvin would put the coat over his shoulders, and, uh, that, that was one of the uh, the things that, that we started having with crowds. Uh, we thought it was us, but it really wasn't. It, <laughs> it was. It was yeah. <laughs> Get right down to it. It was It was Joe. Joe was, was probably the best front man any, any band would want. Joe was just so good about teaching you about the business, about 
how you should conduct yourself on stage. If you were sick, tough it up. Let's let's we've got a job to do. And to this day, I attribute a lot of that, what I've learned, to Joe. He ran a really tight, tight ship. Um, playing six nights a week, we also rehearsed three days a week from about noon to four. I, I got my times right, but it was at least three hours. And you better be at practice, and you better be ready to go, um, or you, you saw that look that Joe would give you, and you knew you didn't want to see that too many times in a row. Um, whether it was the business end of it, whether it was how you look on stage, or how you sing a part, you know, he would try to get the best out of any musician that was working with him. Joe and I were married for seven years. Um, Although I didn't get to see a lot of his rehearsals, he didn't like anybody around when he was rehearsing. He was a perfectionist. He wanted everything to be perfect. He didn't want anybody to have anything to talk about at the end of the, of the gig. Uh, I know that when he was practicing at home, he would listen intently to the track before he'd start rehearsing. And then he would sit there and, and work on it until he got it perfect. really met Joe Hernandez, just kind of heard of Joe, and heard of his band, uh, The Cavaliers, was like the band. Uh, I was actually playing with a, a, a Mexican band, a Latin band, and we did a gig where both of us played. We played and then the Cavaliers played. And I had just gotten with this band. And that night, Joe Hernandez said, here's my number, call me. And the leader of the band was like, oh no, he's gonna take it. Well, I talked to him, he wanted me for the Cavaliers because, um, so that's when I, I started working with the Cavaliers. Joe's love of music and performing was infectious. It was a part of daily life in the Hernandez household. Well, growing up with two professional music musicians as parents, it was it was different. <laughs> it was different than most all my friends that I know. I remember being really, really young and hearing who, who's ever band rehearsing downstairs as I'm me and my sisters are upstairs asleep and. There was music at night all the time with rehearsals. My favorite part um, during rehearsals was when they would, you could, could lay by the vent upstairs in my room and you could hear it um, coming through the vent and I just sometimes fall asleep next to the vent listening to my parents, kind of a lullaby. I was just talking to Jeannie yesterday and I said, you know, I'm doing this interview for dad and um, she said, well that's what I remember was laying by the vent. I was like, yeah, that's what I remember too. Just that was what we did. Um, there are all sorts of people in and out of our basement. Um, musicians are characters. <laughs> lots of lots of eccentric people coming through. I, I just I remember you know them playing the same things over and over and over again and just just getting all these parts right and I didn't know that I was really just kind of in training for <laughs> what I wanted to do in my life because. I just, ever since, as long as I can remember, all I've ever really cared about is playing music as best as I can, the best of my ability. And I, I really owe that to my growing up with my parents being my parents. When I was little, I, I, I went with my parents to the gig and set up and sound check and all kinds of stuff, hauling equipment. My parents definitely didn't have the regular eight to five job. Dad worked at the restaurant during the day. We usually had babysitters or they take us with them. Used to go to rehearsals with my dad, um, Gary's kids and Dominic's kids. We'd all be there playing, listening to him rehearse. 
doing the same lines over and over and over and over again. You didn't, you got sick of the song, but you learn to appreciate it as you get older that that was an experience that, you know, you never forget. So when I was in fifth grade, my dad bought me my first stereo and that really got me interested in listening to music at the time. He took me out to buy my first album and um, I narrowed it down to Stevie Wonder and Earth, Wind and Fire Gratitude, which is that album I have back here that I still have that I've kept since I was in fifth grade. So for my dad's uh, celebration of life, I was able to collect a bunch of music, eight tracks, cassettes, this 45 that he did back in the 70s of time that he wrote and it was the last copy that any of us had. I found this auction site that had auction results of 45s and there must have been 200 records on there and the Beatles, Elvis, all these groups and at the top of the list the number one selling record was by this unknown Latino group called the Cavaliers the people had no idea what it was, but it went for three, four hundred dollars, and there were three copies of it that got sold. And I sent him an email and um, explained the history of this record, where it came from, who my dad was. I sent him photographs of my dad. I sent him a photograph of the record. I even sent him the MP3 of the song to show him that I was honestly Joe Hernandez, <laughs> the, the second, and. Um, he got it for 60 bucks at some other auction and he told me he'd sell it to me for 60 and uh, he'd pay for the shipping. I found a website that had a radio show that was 1970s 45 RPMs and it was like an hour and a half long radio show they did back in 2006 and it had a listing of these songs and one of the songs was Time and I thought well that's probably not it but I'm going to download this and I'm going to listen to it. So I downloaded it and um, I'll be damned. 40 minutes into that show, my dad's song came on, Time, The Cavaliers. My dad would be rolling in his grave if he knew that he was on the radio in California in 2006 for a song he did in the 70s. And it was selling for $200 on the internet to get a copy of that record. The original members of that group was my dad, who kind of led us all in the music path. Raul Ramirez, Jorge Morales. And we did a night, a Monday night, to raise monies. So Joe wasn't playing Monday night at the time. Came down and heard us and uh, nodded, told me, not bad. We traveled quite a bit. And when I was sick, uh, in 87, Joe stepped in to provide energy that, that was missing because I, I couldn't provide it. What a difference they made There's a rainbow before me Skies above can be stormy Since that moment of bliss That really it's heaven when you find romance on your menu. That springboarded my little group to uh, represent the state of Iowa on a tour of the Midwest from uh, northern Minnesota all the way down to Austin, Texas. And he was there every mile, every song, every venue and that was probably one of the best times that we bonded as fellow musicians. Um, but we were more than musicians, we were brothers. On July 26, 2010, Joe was diagnosed with esophageal cancer. It's a date I'll never forget. And he just sat there when we got the diagnosis. He didn't say anything. We left the doctor's office, we got in the car, and he said, Mama, I'm scared. 
But I'll tell you that that never showed at all. But Joe, being the fighter that he was, said, you know, he's going to come through this. And to a certain extent, he did. He was down and out for, oh, maybe about a year. But uh, there was still the fight in Joe. Joe was not a quitter in any way, shape, or form. Even after he had surgery, he wanted to get back to playing as quickly as he could. And I don't even think it was three months after his surgery, he was ready to come back and, and, and start playing again, just like he had been in the past. And he was putting on a show whenever he played. He made sure that they got what they paid for when they came to see him play. There are few musicians who have left a legacy of consistent quality and dedication to the craft. He touched so many lives and acted as a mentor to so many musicians that are still working today in Des Moines and other cities in the country. Mike Shakatano always said that Joe was uh, difficult to work with during the time he was in the Cavaliers. And a few years later, we ran into Mike. And he said, you know, I hated it at the time, but you made me the guitar player that I am today. Actually, he's, you have to consider him as being an influence in the music community in, yep. uh, in Des Moines. You know, it's amazing when you stop and think of all the musicians in this town who have worked under the umbrella of the Cavaliers. They would all tell you they learned something from Joe. Having worked with Joe Hernandez and him being such a perfectionist, musically, vocally, uh, presence-wise on stage, it prepared me for uh, the Las Vegas scene. Uh, totally different scene than, as a matter of fact, I used to tell Joe, you belong in Las Vegas. But he missed his calling by not going to Vegas. He could have made it live on In the Tony Valdez large band, or the Rockets, it came from the Cavaliers. We cut our teeth from the Cavaliers. We're comfortable with each other. We know where we're going to go musically. We know that we can depend on each other. None of that's possible without Hernandez. It's just not. I always considered Las Guitarras like a nice little birthday cake. And Joe, with his harmonies, with his voice, was like the candles lit up, room darkened. That was Guitarras with Joe. Joe gave me that, and I'll never forget that. After fighting a courageous battle against cancer, Joe died on January 29th, 2013, surrounded by friends, family, and bandmates. And there was no doubt in my mind this was going to be a music-filled funeral. And it was a great celebration of who Joe was. He started when he was five years old in front of a store singing for people that would uh, throw money in the hat on the way by. And he played until literally the day he passed away. You know, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think of him because of either some song or some memory that comes along that we played and uh, almost makes tears come to your eyes because uh, his spirit is still with me. Gary and Dominic and I were in the room with him when he passed. To watch a man take his last breath and know in your heart that he got everything that he needed to get, he didn't leave anything behind, is just the way he was as a musician. He, was, he went out a winner in my book. We were brothers. I mean, we, 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 we were real close. I always felt like Joe's big brother. Yeah. Been around him since he was, you know, 15. When we were in shorts or jeans um, at rehearsal, Joe dressed up. We would have band dinner sometimes at one of our houses, and my mom constantly threw him. And she would always say to Joe, oh, Joe, you look so nice. And we used to say, oh, come on, Ruth, please don't tell him that. We'll just never hear the end of it. We were in Little Rock, Arkansas, playing our last night at this club. The, the club had a double-wide trailer that they let the band stay in for the three weeks we were there. And we walk in, and Gary Grimes notices that we've been burglarized immediately. And I hear Joe run to the back where he's staying, 
and he says, son of a bitch, somebody stole my pants. We all kind of got together and said, geez, I wonder if you'll start wearing jeans now. Next place we, next city we went to, he was out buying polyester pants again. Um, Sunday was his break day. Both my parents was the break day. So we would always, he'd make pancakes on Sundays and we'd all eat breakfast together and he'd mow the lawn or do his normal stuff. And my dad loved the movies. Dad and Jesse and I, we went every Sunday to go watch the movies. I remember shining his shoes. That was one of my favorite things to do with him was, I couldn't wait until he shined his shoes because he could smell the polish and he'd get his little, the, the brush and just ch 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 and he'd turn it the other way, you know. I loved that sound of the, of the brushes on, on the shoes. They'd always shine nice. Every, every time he went to work, he always shined his shoes. The Cavaliers were one of the most successful bands in Iowa for over 30 years. In 2001, the Cavaliers were inducted into the Iowa Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. In the Hall of Fame's description of the Cavaliers, they noted a 15-year-old bass sensation, Joe Hernandez. At the 2014 Hall of Fame ceremony, Joe's grandson sang his version of Blue Moon, the song that 15-year-old Joe sang for Monarch's band leader, Lou Cotarucci in the mid-60s, and helped launch Joe's career. I'd been working the midnight shift on the police department for about seven years and finally got a day job. And uh, probably about a day later, I get a phone call. Pick it up, and there's a deep voice on the other end of the phone. Vince, Joe Hernandez. I said, hey, Joe, how you doing? He goes, great, great. He goes, uh, here you got a new job, and you're working days. Are you ready to start playing again? And I said, yeah. I said, with who? He said, with us, with the Cavaliers. And I said, well, what would I be doing, Joe? You're the bass player. Uh, I want you to work as a singer. And, uh, and then you'll play bass, you know, when I get up front and sing. Uh, and then I want you to play a little bit of congas as well. Ain't you proud of To this day, uh, when I'm working somewhere, I, or I'm sure when any of us are playing, working somewhere, uh, you can, we can still feel that influence of Joe, and he is most definitely right there with us. If I can't make it there, you know I'll make it anyway. Ah! We'll be right back. It's up to